In this video, we're going to discuss molecular orbital diagrams. Now, molecular orbital or MO diagrams are ways that we can, uh, we can represent the energies of atomic and molecular orbitals through a, a representative diagram. So what do they look like? So first, to construct an MO diagram, we're going to have a y-axis that's going to be our total uh, energy, right? So our, our potential energy for these electrons, right? So this energy is going to represent the potential energy of the electrons. And what we want to do is on the left and right hand sides of the molecular orbital diagram, we're going to put the atomic orbitals from uh, the atomic orbitals that are involved in the molecule, right? So for the case of H2, as an example, right? On the left-hand side, I will put the hydrogen 1s here, right? H1s. And on the right-hand side over here, I would also put another hydrogen 1s. And inside each of those, I would put one electron. Right, so this is the valence configuration for hydrogen. There's a single electron in the 1s orbital for both hydrogen atoms. Now, in the center of the diagram, we're going to put the molecular orbitals that are formed when these two hydrogens come together and form a bond. In the previous video, we saw that it will form two molecular orbitals, the sigma 1s and the sigma star 1s, right? So we're going to put two molecular orbitals. One's going to be higher in energy than the other, and I'll explain in a second, right? So we'll have one that's at higher energy and then another that is at a lower energy, right? So the lower energy, um, the lower energy orbital, molecular orbital is going to be the sigma 1s, and the higher energy orbital is going to be the sigma star 1s, right? So I'll explain more in detail in just a second, but the sigma star 1s is higher in energy than the sigma bonding orbital, right? So um, for molecular orbitals, uh, they are similar to atomic orbitals in that they can hold only two electrons, right? So you can only hold two electrons in a single molecular orbital, just like you can for a atomic orbital. In the case of H2, we have these two electrons coming together. So they're going to be occupied in the sigma 1s orbital. So they're just gonna pair in that sigma 1s molecular orbital, leaving the sigma star 1s orbital unoccupied, right? So kind of labeling these, right? So on, on each side, you would have the free atom, right? So here you got a free atom, AOs, and then the free atom atomic orbitals here. And then in the center, you have the molecular orbitals. Right, so what I wanna do is point out a few key features here for this molecular orbital diagram. Right, so a few key features. Right, so first note that the bonding molecular orbitals are lower in energy than the free atom 1H, 1S orbitals for each individual hydrogen atom, right? So since it's lower in energy, that means it's gonna be more stable, right? Things that are lower in energy are more stable. So these uh, th this sigma 1S, the electrons that are in the sigma 1S are going to favor bonding, right? So the bonding, sigma 1s is lower in energy than the hydrogen 1s. And so that means they will favor bonding. Now by contrast, note that the antibonding molecular orbital is not only higher in energy than the sigma 1s, it's not only higher in energy than the bonding orbital, it's higher in energy than the free atom orbitals as well. So the antibonding orbitals are higher in energy than the free atoms. So any electrons that are in this orbital would not favor bonding, right? So the antibonding orbital, so the antibonding sigma star 1s, is higher in energy
than the hydrogen one is. So it does not favor bonding. Right. So you want to think about this as far as like, you know, whatever's lowest is in energy is what the system would rather be doing. Right. So obviously the most favorable outcome here is to form this bond, this bonding orbital, the sigma one S. So to form the bond, um, the least favorable outcome is having electrons occupying this sigma star one S, this anti bonding orbital. Right. And obviously the middle ground is just the, the two atoms going their separate ways, right? So, uh, so this energy kind of gives us a little bit of insight into bond strength, right? Because electrons that are occupied in bonding orbitals are going to favor uh, bond formation and electrons that are occupied in anti-bonding orbitals are going to not favor bond formation. So in this way, this interplay between bonding and anti-bonding orbitals are going to give us some insight into bond strength. And that metric that we use to calculate that is called the bond order. So we have bond order. The bond order is just gonna be using our uh, molecular orbital electron configuration in order to figure out the bond strength for, uh, for a given molecule, for a given bond, right? So, uh, so for the bond order, it has an equation. That equation is, we want to take the number of bonding electrons. So the number of bonding electrons and subtract from that the number of anti-bonding electrons. So subtract the number of anti-bonding electrons and you want to divide that number by two right so number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by two this two comes from the localized electron model right we know that um, electrons are localized or you know the localized electron model puts these electrons in localized pairs, right? Electron pairs and bonding pairs. So this two is a artifact of the uh, localized electron model. But this bond order gives us some a way to quantify the strength of a bond, right? So it's, it's, it's not really a full quantification because it's not gonna have units, right? But it gives us a relative way to compare bond strengths in different scenarios. Right. So let's let's look at an example. So let's say, for example, we were comparing the bond strength of two different molecules. Let's say we had H2. And we had H2 minus. Right. So we want to compare H2 versus H2 minus. And we want to say, you know, we want to ask ourselves which molecule, which bond would have the stronger bond? Would it be H2? or H2 minus. Obviously the only difference between these two molecules is that H2 minus is going to have an extra electron. Right? So let's let's see what we got here. Right? So we know that for H2 for H2 this guy is going to have two valence electrons. And for H2 minus this guy is going to have three valence electrons, right? Cuz it's got one extra one. Right. So let's look at the molecular orbital diagrams. Right. So for H2, its molecular orbital diagram would look like the following. Right. So we'll still have this hydrogen 1S on this side. Hydrogen 1S on this side. Right. Those guys would come together. To form. the sigma star 1s and the sigma 1s, right? And that's going to be true for both cases. So let me just go ahead and draw the skeleton for the MO diagram here as well. So hydrogen 1s there. Mm -mm. Hydrogen 1s here. Right, so we got sigma star 
1S and Sigma 1S. Okay, cool. Now, for the sake of H2, right, we're going to have one electron here and one electron here. For H2 minus, we're going to have two electrons in one of these guys and one electron here, right? It doesn't matter where you put the two electrons in this, in this case. As long as you've got three electrons total, it's a correct MO diagram. Okay, so since we have two electrons here, like we saw in the previous example of an MO diagram, right, this guy is going to pair these uh, electrons are going to pair in the 1s bonding orbital, right? And this gives us our MO diagram for H2. For H2 minus, right, it's going to have three electrons. So we're going to have these two paired in the sigma 1s. But remember, each of these molecular orbitals can only hold two electrons. So that means that the third one is going to have to go into this sigma star 1s antibonding orbital, right? So now we have everything we need to calculate the uh, the bond order in both cases. So I'm going to abbreviate bond order BO. So our bond order here for H2 and keep in mind our let's go back to our equation so that we're on the same page, right? We got the number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons over 2. So if we do that here for H2, we got two bonding electrons minus no anti-bonding electrons over 2. 2 over 2 is going to give us a bond order of 1, right? Like I said, it's, it's a way to quantify it, but like I said, there's no units for these bond orders. So this number is going to be meaningless unless we're comparing it to something else, right? Which we are here for H2 minus. So in H2 minus, we got uh, two bonding electrons, but now we got one antibonding electron. So we're going to take minus 1 there divided by 2. So that's going to give us a bond order of 0 0.5. So the way that these bond orders work is that the higher the bond order, the stronger the bond, right? So if you have a, a higher bond order, that's going to indicate a stronger bond. So as far as the question to which bond is stronger, whether it's H2 or H2 minus, it's going to be H2. Right. So H2 is going to have the stronger bond because it has a bond order of one versus for H2 minus it has a bond order of 0.5. But let's talk a little bit about physically what's happening here. Right. This extra electron that is added in H2 is added in H2 minus. It is added in an antibonding orbital. So whereas you went from having no electrons that uh, disfavor bonding you now have one electron in this system that disfavors bonding. So even though it's an extra electron, it's not going to strengthen that interaction. It's actually going to weaken it because it's being placed in an anti-bonding orbital, right? So, so that kind of explains it physically why these numbers come out the way they do and why H2 would have a stronger bond here. Okay, so in the next video, I want to go through a few more examples of calculating the bond order so that we can get a little bit more comfortable with doing these calculations, uh, drawing these diagrams, and making sense of molecular orbitals.